Nellis Air Force Base. We can neither confirm nor deny the existence of UFOs in Area 51. Imagine if you were a caveman and you stepped into a television studio in 1992. You would not be able to comprehend anything that was going on around you. I believe that's probably where we are in terms of this UFO phenomenon. This is the Sky Report from the Griffith Observatory in Los Angeles for the week ending July 7th. Jupiter is a third of the way up the sky. As the All over the world, people are reporting strange objects in the sky, flying objects that they can't identify, objects known as UFOs. In recent years, thousands of UFO sightings have been reported throughout North America, South America, Western Europe, Russia, Australia, Japan, in fact, just about every region on Earth. According to experts, these thousands of reports probably represent only 10% of the actual sightings. What is a UFO? With careful analysis, many UFOs have a conventional explanation. Some turn out to be natural phenomena, comets, meteors, strange clouds, even the aurora borealis. Some UFOs are actually misidentified aircraft. This UFO, photographed over Catalina Island, remained unidentified until advanced computer analysis showed that it is probably a small airplane. Civilians living near military bases occasionally catch glimpses of aircraft so secret that the government won't even admit they exist. Some of these aircraft could easily be mistaken for a UFO. Some UFOs are fakes. This photo looks convincing, but the photographer admitted that it's actually a hubcap thrown into the air. But some UFOs appear to be intelligently guided physical objects with no conventional explanation. They're usually sighted in the air, but sometimes on the ground. Their behavior often suggests advanced technology, and many researchers believe that some UFOs may be extraterrestrial spacecraft. Supporting this idea, some UFOs are sighted with beings that could be called aliens. In the summer of 1991, I was living at the top of Topanga Canyon, which is outside of Los Angeles, California. One evening, I was out on the balcony with two friends, and we saw a strange hovering red light in the sky. It appeared first by itself, and then there was a second light which appeared alongside the first followed by a third light appearing on the other side when I got out of my car and walked underneath the, uh, the object I had a tingling sensation all over my body my uh, my kneecap and my wrist uh, started aching and I could tell that there was uh, it was a, uh, a force that was uh, causing some kind of a problem uh, at that point I realized that this was probably not a water tank I was living in the Angeles National Forest, north of Los Angeles, and uh, I stayed home from work one day, and about 10 a.m. I was sitting on my patio, and I saw three saucer-like objects go by in the air so fast, it was just like, choo, choo, choo. and uh, it was something I've never seen, something going that fast. About three seconds later, there were three fighter jets chasing them. But the amazing thing was that the fighter jets 
were, were going their full speed but seemed to be standing still compared to the speed of the saucer-like objects. I saw in the distance a UFO floating along uh, probably a mile away from me over these fields of wheat uh, it, with it emitting a very large beam of light just incredibly bright just illuminating like day the area it was it was going it was uh, so bright and there would then there would be two and they'd be like this and they'd go like that and they'd be all over and I stood up I was sitting down I stood up and looked at it and the lights went off but I could see its outline and it started to come toward me it kind of turned like this and it came toward me as we're driving down the road uh, I was asleep in the front seat and all of a sudden I woke up and there's this bright light behind us and I, we both assumed it was a truck um, it uh, stayed right on our tail and we couldn't uh, it wouldn't pass us or anything like that so my, my wife just started speeding up and when I looked over the speed armor was pegged at 100 miles an hour and this thing was right behind us and I looked back and there was no headlights it was just one big mass of light and our headlights were just about out we couldn't hardly see anything uh, they were so dim in comparison uh, the next thing that we know we are on the side of the road at a dead stop and it's pitch black it was a moonless night and there was uh, absolutely nothing around anywhere and we went from 100 miles an hour to a dead stop with no uh, no reference of time in between there was no braking or anything it was just uh, it was an instantaneous uh, transition um, it just seemed like we weren't supposed to talk about it and uh, it, since it was something that was so bizarre we didn't feel that anybody believe us anyways. Visual sighting is the most common kind of UFO encounter. Sightings almost always occur by surprise, so most witnesses are unprepared to take photos. Nonetheless, some remarkable photos have been taken over the years, as well as film and video footage. Some photos have been subjected to laboratory testing for fraud, and while some frauds have been detected this way, other photos appear to be absolutely genuine. UFOs show up on radar. In Belgium in 1990, four military radars confirmed a UFO sighting. Two F-16 jets pursued the object, also tracking it on radar, but they couldn't keep up. One jet's radar showed the UFO descending from an altitude of 10,000 feet to 500 feet in just five seconds, accelerating fast enough to kill a human pilot. Belgian military officials admitted they could not explain these events. UFOs also leave physical evidence. Researchers have compiled over 4,000 so-called trace cases from around the world. Physical traces can include rings of scorched vegetation, indentations in the ground, even fragments of strange metal. UFOs also seem to have dramatic temporary effects on physical objects. For example, some witnesses report that their cars or home appliances stop functioning during a UFO encounter, but start working again when the UFO disappears. Some researchers surmise that something about UFO propulsion may affect electrical systems. UFOs may also be related to strange cases of livestock mutilation and crop formations. Since at least 1967, hundreds of cattle and other animals have been found dead and mutilated on the open range. Typically, one or both eyes, one or both ears, tongue and jaw tissue, and various internal organs have been cut away with surgical precision. Researchers have determined that the cuts seem to be made with high heat, possibly by a laser. In cases throughout the United States and Canada, as well as Brazil, Australia, and many other countries, there is never a sign of human activity around the carcasses, nor is there any explanation for the technical precision of the cuts. In many cases, however, witnesses report seeing lights in the sky over areas where carcasses are later found, and a few witnesses have even said they've seen animals being lifted as if by levitation into a waiting UFO. Contrasting with the gruesome animal mutilations, beautiful pictograms have been mysteriously appearing in the crop fields of many nations, especially southern England. In the early 1980s, simple circles were the norm, but each year they've become more elaborate and more numerous. 
One by one, conventional explanations have failed. In October of 1991, two gentlemen came forward saying they had hoaxed the whole thing, a story that made front page news. But their claim quickly fell apart. The sheer number of formations would be impossible for two people to accomplish, and besides, these two gentlemen could not produce even one formation that matched the subtle details of the real thing. Meanwhile, 1991's pictograms were more elaborate than ever, none more astounding than the Barbary Castle formation, which appeared the morning after a night of lights in the sky. Colin Andrews, a leading expert on crop formations, explains. It begins, the story begins, really, uh, with regard to this tremendous, uh, tremendously large and impressive marking uh, on one summer's night when a number of people traveling along a road south of the town of Swindon saw a flash of light in the sky. It was an orange flash of light. Lightning was not in the vicinity. Uh, these, the cumulonimbus clouds associated with storms was not there. And they were, they had their attention drawn to the sky due to the fact there was this bright flash of light. From that same spot in the sky came a beam of light with a rippling, with rippling edges, rippling veil, if you will, of golden light from the sky to the ground. At the end of the golden beam of light manifested a golden ball at ground level. Now, that ball was seen to uh, discharge, if you like. It, it, it faded away. And this same sequence occurred again within 15 seconds, two flashes of light, two curtains of golden rippling light, two golden balls manifesting at ground level. We were able, by simple triangulation methods, to ascertain where that aerial phenomena uh, literally reached ground level. And the pattern you've just seen was precisely that spot, that night, that pattern arrived in that field. If we consider only that one pattern, we have to be looking at a phenomenon here which is of the greatest importance to all of us. What you're looking at there is the Mandelbrot set. Now that is a, a universal mathematical constant. It's the most complex arithmetic graphic form known to man. We've only been able to produce that in graphic form via computers in recent times, in recent years. It's a highly complex uh, mathematical universal constant. Now, we were looking at that pattern and one would have to say, if that pattern ever arrived on our planet, we would have something to consider. Because that equates to the, uh, the point at which order actually breaks down into chaos. That is the arithmetic graphical form which represents that state between order and chaos. Indeed, the very state which the indigenous people have been suggesting we have arrived at. And there it is. That is the Mandelbrot set. That arrived in a wheat field south of Cambridge in England just a few months ago. That indeed is the Mandelbrot set. Now that is the only graphic form which we certainly can su support scientifically uh, and have knowledge of its meaning. If that actually represents in the cereal crops of our planet what we understand uh, is representative of the mathematical equation, then indeed those indigenous people for the first time have something to focus our attention upon. Nearly all UFO researchers believe that a small group of military and government leaders have successfully hidden the reality of UFOs from the general public. Some researchers feel that the so-called UFO cover-up may be the biggest, best-kept secret of all time. Some of the most relevant information that's been uh, declassified by our own government comes through the Auto of the Freedom of Information Act documents from the Central Intelligence Agency, the FBI, the Air Force, um, and DARPA, uh, Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. These agencies, <clears throat> in disclosing their supposedly classified data, have made it very clear that uh, our government's been profoundly interested in following the, I guess, activities of UFOs over the years, incursions of um, strategic air command bases, Falcon Bridge, Malmstrom, Loring, all over the country, uh, 1975, um, over Tehran in 1974, over Cuba in 1967, over Alaska, uh, over Hawaii, all over the country. And 
even landings at Kirtland Air Force Base at New Mexico. And these aren't coincidences. And the fact the government acknowledges these, um, along with such things as landing as the Bentwater uh, uh, Air Base in England, the United Kingdom, suggests very clearly that the government knows what's going on and they're just holding, withholding their data uh, because they don't want to scare the public. If the cover-up is real, it may well have begun in 1947 at Roswell Army Air Force Base in New Mexico. On July 8, 1947, Roswell's public information officer, Lieutenant Walter Haught, issued a press release in which he said the military had recovered wreckage of a flying saucer that had crashed on a nearby ranch. The story caused an immediate sensation, but one day later, it was retracted. The military now said that the wreckage was a weather balloon. Oddly, that wreckage was secretly flown to Wright Field in Dayton, Ohio, and was never seen again. And there the story might have ended. But in the late 1970s, several witnesses to the so-called Roswell incident decided to talk. One of them, Major Jesse Marcel, had been Roswell's intelligence officer and the first military man on the crash site. He had been familiar with all kinds of aircraft, rockets, balloons, even the top secret devices of his day. He had handled a great deal of the Roswell wreckage, and in his words, it was nothing from this earth. Marcel, in fact, believed that he had handled pieces of an extraterrestrial spacecraft. From 1947 on, UFO sightings were so prevalent that the CIA became concerned. In January of 1953, they convened the so-called Robertson Panel to assess the national security implications of UFOs. The panel quickly reached two conclusions. On one hand, there was no evidence of a direct threat to national security from UFOs. On the other hand, there was a threat of public mass hysteria if UFO reports continued unchecked. Therefore, the CIA recommended an immediate policy of debunking with the goal of reducing public interest in UFOs. Captain Edward J. Rappelt, then chief of the Aerial Phenomena Branch of the Air Technical Intelligence Center, explained the new policy this way. We're ordered to hide sightings when possible, he said, but if a strong report does get out, we have to publish a fast explanation make up something to kill the report in a hurry, and also ridicule the witness, especially if we can't figure an answer. We even have to discredit our own pilots. The question remains, how much was really known about UFOs, and who knew it? Recent disclosures indicate that an elite group inside the government may have known a great deal. In 1984, an undeveloped roll of 35 millimeter film was anonymously sent to UFO researchers Bill Moore and Jamie Chandra in California. When developed, the film showed eight pages of an alleged top secret document. The title page read, Briefing Document, Operation Majestic 12, prepared for President-elect Dwight D. Eisenhower. The document described MJ-12 as a super secret committee that dealt with alien-related information. It said that the Roswell incident was a genuine UFO crash recovery, complete with alien bodies. It described other recoveries as well, and said that the fact of alien intelligence on the Earth was a matter of extreme importance, requiring absolute secrecy. The document was made public in 1987 and set off a storm of controversy. Skeptics immediately branded it a hoax, but other researchers studied it in detail, looking for signs of fraud. To their surprise, no obvious fraud could be found. Even tiny details of history and style checked out. Nonetheless, the verdict on MJ-12 remains ambiguous. The document may indeed be a hoax, but a hoax this good could only come from an inside source. Who would want to release such a document, and why? So far, nobody knows for sure. Many researchers believe that secret government knowledge of UFOs goes far beyond the recovery of crashed saucers. In recent years, alleged eyewitnesses have reported direct face-to-face -face meetings between military personnel and live aliens. Other witnesses claim that the government is in possession of alien technology. In just a few moments, you will hear the direct testimony of two such witnesses. The first witness is a man we'll call Bill, formerly an Air Force tech sergeant with a top secret clearance. In 1965, Bill was stationed at Peterson Field in Colorado Springs. One day, he was assigned as a steward aboard an airplane with a secret destination. The plane flew to Washington, D.C., where it picked up a two-star general. 
It then flew to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base and picked up an eight-man civilian science team. Finally, it flew to Alamogordo, New Mexico, arriving in the evening. The next morning, Bill and the others got on a bus and drove until they reached a box canyon. Here's how Bill describes what happened next. We went on in. All of a sudden, it opened up, and here's uh, Quonset huts, hangars, and a flight line. And we pull up there, and then the uh, special team, the science team, got off and went over to cross the ramp. And here is a UFO sitting on the ramp. Here are two beings standing there, okay, that are communicating, however they're communicating. The general was a little over six foot tall. And the uh, two individuals were equal in height to him. Um, they had flight suits on that were a silver gray, okay? They didn't have helmets or anything like that. They were long-fingered, right. okay? Five-fingered, but they were long-fingered, very delicate, very slim, okay? Not a definition in hip, waist-hip type situation. Uniform was one piece, boot all the way up. We saw the demonstration as far as the flying of the craft, hovering, disappear, come back, uh, virtually no sound. From there, uh, we went back very hush-hush. That's the last we heard of anything. Could it be that government personnel have not only met live aliens, as Bill says, but have even acquired alien technology? In 1989, a man named Bob Lazar appeared on Las Vegas television claiming that he was a physicist hired by the Office of Naval Intelligence to study an alien spacecraft held at a secret location near Groom Lake, Nevada. Since 1989, researchers have tried to either prove or disprove Lazar's sensational claims, but have failed to reach a verdict. Meanwhile, Lazar sticks by his story, and with the passage of time, it seems increasingly likely that he's telling the truth. What he says is astounding. Between December of 88 and April of 89, I worked as a senior staff physicist in what has to be the most secret project in history. My place of work was a facility at an area known as S-4 on the Nellis Air Force Range in central Nevada. Area S-4 is located approximately 15 miles south of the infamous Area 51 installation at Groom Lake, where the U-2 and SR-71 spy planes were developed. For the duration of my employment at S-4, I was paid by the United States Navy. I had at least partial views of the nine different disks out at Area S-4, but the one I'm going to describe to you now is the one in which I not only saw two of the three interior levels, but I also saw it fully functional in flight. This particular disc appeared to be in excellent condition and because of its sleek appearance, I nicknamed it the Sport Model. The Sport Model is about 16 feet tall and 40 feet in diameter. The exterior skin of the disc is metal, which is the color of unpolished stainless steel. The Sport Model sits on its belly when it's not energized. The power source is a reactor, which uses element 115 as a fuel, and uses a total annihilation reaction to provide the heat which it converts to energy, making it a compact, lightweight, efficient onboard power source. As you can see, the hatch is located on the upper half of the disc with just the bottom portion of the door wrapping around the center lip of the disc. The interior level of the disc is divided into three levels. The lower level is where the three gravity amplifiers and amplifier guides are located. The reactor is located directly above the three gravity amplifiers on the center level and is in fact centered between them. The reactor is similar to this half-scale model. The element 115 is machined into triangles like this and is then inserted into the reactor. The center level of this disk also houses the control consoles and seats, both of which were too small and too low to the floor to be functional for adult human beings. My job in this program was to be part of a back engineering team. Back engineering is the act of taking a finished product and tearing it apart to find out what makes it tick. The goal in this program was to see if the technology of the disk could be duplicated with earth materials. As part of my indoctrination into the program at S4, I would randomly be taken into a small room which contained a table, a chair, and 120 or so briefings in blue folders. I'd be left there to read for varying amounts of time, usually about half an hour. These briefings contained a wide spectrum of information, mostly relating to aliens and alien technology. These reports appeared to be an overview of alien information, which could be used to brief scientists from any field about the scope of the whole project, 
and not just their specific field of endeavor. In May of 1987, some scientists took an antimatter reactor to an underground blast facility on the Nevada test site to perform an experiment. Unfortunately for them, their experiment required them to cut the reactor open, which resulted in their deaths. This explosion was explained to others at the test site as a previously unannounced low-yield underground nuke test. I was hired in December of 1988 to replace one of these men. The S-4 installation is built into the mountain and the nine hangar doors are angled at about 60 degrees. These doors are covered with a sand textured coating to blend in with the side of the mountain and the desert floor. The hangar that housed the sport model was like a typical airplane hangar with the exception of the angled doors that I mentioned before. The hangar was equipped with typical tools and extensive electronic equipment. It also had a machine with an x-ray emblem on it and an overhead crane rated at 20,000 pounds. Equipment in this hangar was marked with a black number 41 with a white circle around it. It was outside of this hangar that I saw the sport model tested. Probably the most amazing thing about Area 51 is the fact that this is literally the only place in the world where you can go out and actually see flying saucers on a timetable basis. You can literally go out there on a Wednesday night between about 7 and, and 1 a.m. and you'll see these things flying up and down the valley. It's absolutely amazing. On, a, on even a bad night, you'll have 10, 11, 12 sightings. On a good night, and I've been out there with, with friends of mine camping, on a good night, the sky will just rip open with these things. You'll see anywhere between 20 to 40 objects in a night testing over the base for uh, anywhere from 15 minutes to 45 minutes at a time. You'll see these objects flying up and down the, uh, up and down the valley. We've had people where these objects have flown right over their heads as they've, as they've gotten out, fumbled for their cameras and then uh, shot away. Area 51 is the single most amazing thing because first off, we know the military's got them. Second off, in their pure arrogance, they really don't care whether or not we see them or not. And third off, it's much easier to make us look crazy because we're just civilians out there than it is to test this stuff over their own land, over Nellis Air Force Base, where uh, uh, experts or uh, people that have something to do with a project or security personnel can actually come forward and expose this project. But I'm hoping that Area 51 is going to be the camel's nose under the tent, that enough people are going to go out there and start seeing these things, enough people who are skeptical about it, who are going to see these things for themselves and realize, by God, there's something there, because this is the singular most important scientific advance in the history of the human race. If at least some people in government know that UFOs are real, why don't they just tell us? One reason may be that the UFO situation remains puzzling even to the most knowledgeable experts. Indeed, if some UFOs are alien spacecraft, as many researchers believe, it may be that no one really knows who these aliens are or what they want. Ample reason for a cover-up. How many government officials would want to risk looking ignorant and powerless in the face of something as momentous as the discovery of alien intelligence right here on planet Earth. Another justification for the secrecy may be the possibility of social upheaval. In 1979, a former CIA official named Victor Marchetti published an article titled How the CIA Views the UFO Phenomenon. In it, he theorized that all major governments are committed to hiding the fact of alien intelligence from the public for fear that disclosure might, in his words, erode the foundations of Earth's traditional power structure. He went on to say that political and legal systems, religions, economic and social institutions could all soon become meaningless in the minds of the public. Civilization as we know it could collapse into anarchy. Such extreme conclusions are not necessarily valid, he said, but they probably accurately reflect the fears of the ruling classes of the major nations. The Robertson Panel Report, discussed earlier in this program, demonstrates that our government has long considered UFOs to be a national security issue. Is public hysteria their only concern, or is there more? Millions of citizens believe they have had a close encounter with an alien. Some say the experience was wonderful. Others feel traumatized. 
In these accounts, aliens of many kinds are described. But a high percentage of unpleasant encounters, also called abductions, seem to involve a particular kind of alien known as a gray. Does this mean that some aliens are dangerous? Assuming that the abduction experience actually involves alien encounter, the alien's intent is by no means clear. Does anyone in our government have the answer? So far, we don't know. For most citizens, the challenge posed by UFOs and aliens is a personal one. Depending on what we already believe, adjusting to the arrival of alien intelligence could seem easy or almost impossible. Fear of the unknown is one of humankind's most basic traits. Any one of us might feel fear on first meeting an alien, especially if it looked very strange to our eyes. But fear, though understandable, is not necessarily warranted. If we prepare ourselves ahead of time with knowledge and self-confidence, we may be able to ignore our fears long enough to find out what's really going on. Indeed, the results might be astounding. Whether we like it or not, UFOs are telling us that the human race is probably not alone. Instead, we probably belong to a galactic community of intelligence, a cosmic neighborhood. If so, we may be approaching a completely new understanding of life in the universe. Such changes occur only rarely in human history. They can seem disruptive and alarming at first, but in the end, they signal a tremendous opportunity for human growth. If this is the final outcome of the UFO mystery, then UFOs might one day be regarded as one of the best things that ever happened to us. I'm Michael Lindemann.